today to uh, am pleased to announce that we have resolved uh, Gregory Lee Johnson, also goes by Joey Johnson, his lawsuit for First Amendment retaliation and other claims, malicious prosecution and others, against the city of Cleveland, uh, Chief Calvin Williams, and various Cleveland police officers who interfered with his right to free speech, his right to symbolic speech, uh, at the 2016 Republican National Convention. The settlement amount, monetarily, is $225,000 which is a significant sum and speaks volumes about the constitutional harm that was done to Mr. Johnson. But there is no amount of money that can give him his speech back at that particular historical moment in not just American history, but world history. It was the moment when Donald Trump was being uh, coronated by the Republican Party it was a moment where authoritarianism was on the rise uh, and, and continues to rise in America. We see it happening throughout the globe. And this was a moment that Gregory Lee Johnson, who has been an activist for many years on human rights issues, wanted to speak up in symbolic protest and wanted to protest government policy and wanted to protest the rising authoritarianism represented by Donald Trump. That moment is gone, it has passed, he will never get it back, and there is no amount of money that will ever compensate him for it. Even though the amount of money being tendered in this settlement uh, is a reflection, in our view, of uh, the significance of the evidence against these city officials for their misconduct. Now. It is standard in settlement agreements, of course, for defendants to avoid potential future liability to disclaim uh, all wrongdoing and liability, and that's the case here because that's a standard clause. But the settlement agreement does include an acknowledgement that Texas v. Johnson, the case from 1989 from the U.S. Supreme Court that bears Mr. Johnson's name is the law of the land of our country. That was the case that held that burning the American flag in protest of the government is symbolic speech protected by the free speech clause of the First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. It was 30 years ago, and yet the city of Cleveland, in its work regarding the RNC, apparently could not find its way to enforce the Constitution within Cleveland city limits. Now, I have a couple of more comments before I turn this over to uh, our client, uh, Gregory Lee Johnson, and, and that's this. There's still no accountability. There's still no accountability. And while you and the media and others may hear uh, some sort of protest that there's some kind of reasonable dispute here or that somehow... Uh, Mr. Johnson was on fire or had set other people on fire, as Chief Calvin Williams said in his press conference, that is categorically false. And we cannot allow ourselves and we cannot have the media be gaslit by that kind of nonsense because we have lots of video footage and still footage that shows you what happened that day. I'm going to play that for you now before I turn it over to Mr. Johnson. So the first slide you should see here is the, the tweet from the Cleveland Division of Police that recognizes that there's going to be a demonstration at East Fourth and Prospect and that there may be flag burning. But then look what they go on to say. Cleveland fire on scene to take care of that. This is the official police Twitter feed of the city of Cleveland. The official feed is announcing to the world that they're going to take care of flag burning instead of what? Properly preparing for this convention and recognizing that that is protected speech. If you look at the next slide, you will see uh, that firefighters just entered the crowd here at the flag burning protest. Again, preparation by the Cleveland police to suppress speech. 
And then if you look at the third slide, what you see is protester lit flag on fire, then lit himself on fire, catching others on fire. Flames extinguished by firefighters, no serious injuries. That was false as video and still images of that video conclusively demonstrate. Now look at this freeze frame. You see the police officer extinguishing the burning flag with water. You see him, I'm going to play it again. Let's go back to the beginning. And what you see is the officer extinguishing while Mr. Johnson has plenty of room around him. And there's nothing going on here. No, he's not on fire. His pants are, on, are not on fire, which is one of the things that Chief Calvin Williams said with the mayor next to him in the press conference. It's false. It's a lie. And so you have to, now maybe you cut the chief a little slack and say maybe that's what he was told, but why did he say it with such certainty? And why did the, the, this then lead to a prosecution? Let's keep playing. Again, watch the video, and what you'll see is the police officer wanting to extinguish that symbolic speech. And there it is. No one's on fire. Mr. Johnson didn't catch anyone on fire. It was a lie. It was a dirty lie to justify the suppression of free speech. And no one has been held accountable. No police officer, not the police chief, no one. Where is the Internal Affairs Office? Where's the investigation of these officers? Where is the Civilian Police Review Board? Where is their investigation of these officers? Where is the county prosecutor, the city prosecutor, prosecutor who have let the statute of limitations for the misdemeanor offense of interfering with civil rights on the part of public officials, they have let that expire. So this is a serious matter because it is a matter about the rule of law. Now, in that vein, before I bring up Mr. Johnson, I want to thank the dedicated volunteer lawyers who stood up for civil rights, who stood up for civil liberties in a way that unfortunately and regrettably Cleveland police officers and Cleveland city officials did not during the Republican National Convention. The National Lawyers Guild, uh, organized by Jacqueline Green, who is here today, um, and, and she's going to say a few words after Mr. Johnson speaks. Uh, we have Marty Gelfand, we have Sidney Saffold, uh, and do we have anybody else? Here? Uh, oh, Sarah Gelsomino, thank you. Well, come back over here and join us, please, please, please. I'm so sorry. So, so what, what we had was a, a, a group of at least 40 lawyers who stood up and defended civil liberties and defended 16 individuals. Andrea Whitaker was Mr. Johnson's attorney. She, she is going to be here a little later. Um, we had a group of lawyers who stood up and defended people who were wrongfully prosecuted in the, the most asinine way by city officials who just simply couldn't concede that they had done something wrong. And we had lawyers step up for the rule of law in a way that city officials wouldn't do. So, with that backdrop in mind, you know, yes, we have a settlement here, but we do not have accountability. And we will probably never have accountability given the way that these officials are conducting themselves. On that backdrop, I'd like Mr. Johnson to please step forward and share his thoughts about this resolution and his message. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I was a defendant in 1989 in the U.S. Supreme Court case Texas versus Johnson, where I fought to establish that burning the American flag in protest was constitutionally protected speech. We're here to announce a settlement of my lawsuit against the city of Cleveland and the Cleveland Police Division, holding them accountable for what happened here during the Republican National Convention in 2016. Has Trump 
was delivering his fascist message of white supremacy, law and order, scapegoating of immigrants, disgusting misogyny, and naked America first chauvinism to the Republican National Convention. Outside, up against all of this, the Revolution Club linked arms and I stood in the middle of the circle and lit, lit the red, white, and blue rag of imperialism on fire. Our message to the world, America was never great. We need to overthrow this system. Cleveland police, along with other state and federal agencies, launched an unjust, vicious police assault to break up our protest. I was put in a chokehold and dragged to the ground. Others were knocked down. Altogether, 16 Revolution Club members and other protesters were brutally arrested, dragged off to jail, and held for more than 24 hours until the RNC was over. The police repeatedly lied to the media, changing their story about why we were arrested, in spite of videos that showed clearly it was the police that assaulted and endangered the protesters. Besides the arrest of myself, two of the arrested faced serious felony charges and years in prison, and more than a dozen others faced multiple misdemeanors. After more than a year of fighting these prosecutions, all the charges were dropped against all of us, or they were dismissed outright. In fact, most were dismissed after a judge held an evidentiary hearing and found that we were engaged in lawful protests, and he specifically cited Texas versus Johnson as the authority for his ruling. Now, the city of Cleveland has been forced to settle the lawsuit I brought in the wake of winning our criminal cases. While the city has tried to minimize and deny its liability, this settlement of all, almost a quarter million dollars speech, speaks much louder than their denials. The city settled this case because they knew our arrests and prosecutions were an assault on a Supreme Court precedent that I won 30 years ago. Burning the American flag in protest is constitutionally protected symbolic speech. And in my case, it expresses unmistakable contempt and revulsion for what this country and this government stands for in the world. The city, has, the city was afraid to have all this come out in a trial, so they have settled. What we did in burning the flag outside the Republican National Convention in 2016 was not only our right, it was the righteous thing to do. I burned the flag at the RNC because it's wrong to close our eyes to the history of genocide and slavery, the wars of empire, the invasions and occupations, the coups and torture, and all the atrocities the U.S. has committed here and around the world. I really believe, as Bob Avakian, the leader of the revolution, says, American lives are not more important than other people's lives. I and others in the Revolution Club, and we urge others to join with us, are urgently working for the day when this empire can no longer terrorize and brutalize and oppress people all over the world. I plan to donate generously to the ways that will bring further, that will further bring <coughs> that closer. I want to thank all the attorneys involved in this case. I'm, I'm extremely appreciative of all of your efforts um, because you all, from your own perspective, step forward to, to fight this case because you believe from your own perspectives that it was important. The National Lawyer Guild, Lawyers Guild, the National Lawyers Guild, uh, Jacqueline Green and Sarah Gelsomino in the back there, and um, together with the NAACP organized over 40 volunteer attorneys that represented the RNC 16 defendants. My criminal defense attorney, Andrea Whitaker, who's in route here now. And of course, the attorneys who brought this suit from the Chandra Law Firm, Subo Chandra and Patrick Cabot. I'm also encouraging others who were arrested with me at the RNC to file suit against the city of Cleveland and against the Cleveland Police Division. Thank you. Uh, now we're going to hear from uh, the officer from the National Lawyers Guild, Jacqueline Green, who had organized the Army of 
volunteer lawyers who were protecting civil liberties during the 2016 Odyssey. Thank you. Um, I'm Jacqueline Green, partner at Friedman and Gilbert and co-coordinator for the Ohio chapter of the National Lawyers Guild. The Ohio NLG has long been committed to protecting free speech and movement work through our Legal Observer Program and through defending activists and movement workers who are slapped with fabricated charges and illegal arrests and retaliation for their political work and in particular for speech activity. We successfully defended many protesters, forcing prosecutors to drop bogus charges resulting from unconstitutional policing. In preparation for the 2016 RNC in Cleveland, the Ohio NLG organized hundreds of volunteers, people from around Cleveland, around Ohio, across the country, to come in and act as legal observers who serve as witnesses and document police misconduct. In addition, these volunteers were out in the streets every day in the heat in the midst of the throngs of police who were donning riot gear and deterring speech expression. Um, the NLG legal observers were present on the day when Joey Johnson was arrested, and Cleveland police, in the presence of and under the direction of Calvin Williams, the chief of police, violently intervened as these 16 people attempted to engage in protected free speech activity by burning the flag. And they arrested Joey. They arrested these 15 other people with him. This group of folks became known as the RNC 16. They were held <coughs> unjustifiably in jail for 30 hours. And then bogus charges were filed against them. As you heard from Joey, 14 people were charged with misdemeanors and two people were charged with felonies facing up to years in prison for bogus charges for assault on a police officer included in that list. It was the city's job to protect the free speech rights of the people who came to Cleveland to engage in expressive activity in response to Trump's nomination. But instead, the city jailed them and prosecuted them for over a year. And these bogus ch charges filed against the RNC 16 were nothing more than a strident attempt to justify the city's wrongdoing. In the wake of the city's failures, as you heard, other people stepped up to defend the fundamental rights of the RNC 16. We had over 40 lawyers from the NLG, from the Cleveland branch of the NAACP, and from private practice who came to together to defend the sham prosecutions. <laughs> And they worked hard for over a year. First, we saw Joey's charges dismissed, along with the charges of one other protester. Then, and that was thanks in large part to Andrea Whitaker, his attorney. Then, thanks to our felony defense teams, on September 13, 2017, the Cuyahoga County Prosecutor's Office dismissed all the felony charges against those two protesters. And then finally, in October 2017, as you heard, after a lengthy <laughs> and hard-fought evidentiary hearing, the misdemeanor charges against the remaining 14 protesters were dismissed, and attorneys Michael Murray and Steve Schaffron led the charge in that regard. The RNC 16 stood strong, they stood up for their rights, and they fought their charges for over a year. Their dedication came with personal sacrifices and required a lot of hard work. And as we stand here today, it's clear that the charges against the RNC 16, including Joey Johnson, were politically motivated. The Ohio chapter of the NLG stands with movement workers, activists, and demonstrators who exercise their constitutionally protected rights. And we remain committed to defending those who are falsely charged in retaliation for exercising those rights like Joey Johnson was. Cracking down on people who express dissent is an egregious attack on democracy that cannot be tolerated. This settlement in Joey Johnson's case represents a clear acknowledgement that the arrests, jailing, and prosecution of the RNC 16 were illegal. And the Ohio NLG congratulates Joey Johnson and thanks him and his attorneys and all of the RNC 16 for their dedication and hard work in holding the city of Cleveland accountable. Thank you. In conclusion, I'd like to simply note this. As I said at the beginning, we are at a time of rising authoritarianism in our country. It's unmistakable at this point. It is unmistakable that we have concentrated power in the executive. We have the executive ignoring the rule of law, obstruction of justice, and all kinds of nonsense. There was even a report yesterday that Majority Leader uh, Mitch McConnell was having his, is having his path to re-election in Kentucky paved by his wife who's the Secretary of Transportation approving projects to assist him in Kentucky and setting up a special office to do that. We live in a time not only of rising authoritarianism, but open corruption and emoluments. If there were ever a time then in which we need to have magnified voices of dissent, it is now. And if there were ever a time in which we are naturally going to see people like Cleveland police officers who are members of a union
who endorsed the authoritarian now president. If we were ever in a time in which we were likely to see increased suppression, it is now. So that duality, the likelihood of increased free speech suppression as authoritarianism rises, combined with a desperate need for more dissent, means that the media are going to have to be vigilant, lawyers are going to have to be vigilant, the judiciary is going to have to be vigilant, because what we hold near and dear in terms of our fundamental values could quickly erode away. And we don't even live in a place that resembles where we thought we would live. So thank you, everyone, for coming. And uh, we appreciate you coming. And we ask you, I guess this is the last point. The city spokespeople are going to say, well, don't worry about it. We had insurance that covered it. That should make you sick to your stomach. The thought that they're invoking insurance is enabling them to pay for violating fundamental constitutional rights should make all of us sick to our stomachs. So please don't repeat that statement without acknowledging just how hollow and pathetic an excuse that is, especially when no one has been held accountable for what happened here as we can see from the video and still images. Thank you for coming. Mr. Johnson. Yeah. Do you personally feel vindicated with this settlement? Yeah, I do. I think it's a substantial settlement. It represents a, it, re it represents an admission of liability, even though they deny it. Um, they wouldn't have put this much money on the table if they didn't know what they did, did was wrong and that it would have come out in the course of a trial. Plus another 50 for Stephen Griffin. Is all right. right. There's an, another co-defendant who's already been awarded 50000 Stephen Griffin. And I've encouraged the other defendants to, to file suit. I hope they do. Has the city reached out to you in any way? Excuse me? Has the city reached out to you in any way? No, there's not, not a lot of talk going on between us. <laughs> so you plan to continue burning the flag? Yeah, it's a symbol of, of international plunder and murder, man. And my starting point is the people of the world and what's in the interest of humanity. Look, you know, in this country, people are indoctrinated and, and brainwashed. And, and I, w I was an exempt from that. I came up on, on, on Army Brat during the 1960s, during the Vietnam War. But those were very contentious, or rebellious, and defiant times. And people were protesting against, against the war. People, you go back and you look at a lot of the case history for flag burning cases. People were making patches out of the flag and putting it on the seat of their pants. They were sewing peace symbols on the flag. They were burning the flag and to protest the Vietnam War, to protest the oppression of black people. And, uh, you know, that, that's, that's my roots. And I'm trying to stick to those roots because I have a, an even deeper understanding. It's a symbol of empire global exploitation, invasions and occupation, torture, and, and, and like I said in my statement, I'm not closing my eyes to that. And I want to continue standing with the people of the world. And uh, we need an actual revolution to get humanity beyond all this, to get, get beyond the systems of global imperialism oppressing billions of people, 43 billionaires in the world having as much wealth as the bottom half of humanity, three and a half billion people. It's their, the flag is their logo, their brand symbol for, for invasions and occupations to keep that whole system going. Do you so, feel at risk at any point? Excuse me? Do you feel at risk at any point? I do. People in America who love the flag and say that you're burning the flag is an affront to democracy and what the flag stands for. Well, I, I, think, I do think people, some people are being whipped into a, a fascist frenzy. And it goes right along with the the uh, ugly white supremacy that's, that's being promoted and, and emboldened, and, and uh, the male supremacy, the contempt for, for women, you know, the, not just slamming women back, backwards into the dark ages with these fetal heartbeat laws in places like Alabama and Georgia, and, and it's threatened here as well. It's, 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 it's not only that, but they want to say a woman is guilty of, of murder, you know, because they're going to grant the fetus full personhood so then the woman would be guilty of murder, her doctor would be guilty of murder. This is, this is outrageous, and this is 
This is fascist patriarchy and ascendancy. And, and, uh, um, and it goes right along with the uh, America first chauvinism. You know, Trump bragging about, we have nuclear weapons, why don't we use them? Threatening the people of Iran. Have we seen this movie before? Isn't this what they did to the people of Iraq? You know, this, and this belligerence and this, this posture of, of, of intimidation and threatening people with annihilation, nuclear annihilation. So this is all the more reasons that people need to be finding different ways to defy this system. And, and as I said, for the Revolution Club's part, we're not just working to defy it. We're working to make an actual revolution <coughs> to bring about a whole different society a future socialist republic in North America that's not based on exploitation and oppression of billions of people all over the planet, isn't living off the suffering and the exploitation of, to, to make our clothes of, of sweatshop workers in a, in a factory in Bangladesh where the, the walls collapse and hundreds of people die because those are the, the conditions of life that this system of global imperialism forces on people around the world. We don't have to live like this. You know, so I, I know people are being whipped up around this, but um, um, we have to fight through on that for people to see. You know, it's, it's not in their interest to go the way of this empire. You know, to stand for it. What do you say to people who feel that the flag symbolizes the rights that allow someone like yourself to burn it to express themselves? Well, I wouldn't be standing here right now if if I hadn't fought for this. I had, this was not something that was handed to me. It was something that was extracted through tremendous struggle. Um, I went through a five-year court battle from 1984 to 1989, starting in Texas. I shouldn't have been, have been arrested to begin with, to use your logic. I shouldn't have even have, have been arrested, you know, and then dragged through a whole trial. Uh, I was, after my arrest, I was thrown in a cell with white supremacists who repeatedly attacked me. You know, then I went through a whole trial, then I was sentenced to a year in jail and a $2,000 fine. I got out after a, 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 an appeal bond was posted on my behalf. And then, I, and then I had to fight the case for five years to the U.S. Supreme Court. So that, that victory in 1989 was not a, a gift. It, was, it, was, it came through tr tremendous struggle. And it came at a point in, in American history Anyone who's a lawyer will tell you it's really important to look at the historical context when you're trying to understand why the Supreme Court rules one way at one time in history and another way at another time in history. And in 1989, the regimes in Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union were collapsing. And the U.S. was congratulating these political dissenters in Eastern Europe. Now, how are they going to do that and then turn around and imprison me for a year for, for burning their flag? There would be no mistaking that I was a political prisoner. So it, it created a, a quandary, a contradiction for them. And, I, and the way they dealt with it was the decision in my case, which was a close decision by four. You know, but they never, never accepted the decision. There's been calls for a constitutional amendment, calls for a federal statute, attempts at a new federal statute, which we defied. And, and so here we are today. Repeatedly, there's been calls for the constitutional amendment. And then here we are in 2016 in Cleveland, and the Cleveland P PD and whoever else was out there, the Secret Service, Homeland Security, they said, we don't like Texas versus Johnson to hell with it. We'll just ignore it. We'll go ahead and arrest them. They bragged about it, you know, ahead of time. It's pre-planned. How do you feel that the city has accepted no liability in regards to this settlement? Look at the settlement statement. They still state that in, in, the, in, the, in the statement, in the actual statement. And forcing them to include the Texas versus Johnson is the legal precedent. That was, <coughs> was a result of struggle. You know, maybe Mr. Uh, uh, Chandra would like to talk more about that. But that wasn't a gift either. But you yourself said you're an army brat. So have you had dialogue with people who have fought for this country, fought that flag, and, and what was that dialogue? Yeah, I've had dialogue and I've had arguments. And, and look, they're not all of one mind, you know. I think uh, when I came up during the Vietnam War, one of the things that contributed to, to radicalizing me was my stepfather was a sergeant in the, in the Army. And we were living on Army bases in the South and in, in, in Alabama and Georgia and in Germany during the Vietnam War in 1969. 
And I used to have a job, ironically, selling the Stars and Stripes newspaper in the mess halls to the soldiers. So I'd go hang out with the soldiers after, after chow and just talk with them. They weren't too interested in my newspaper, but we would talk about the war in Vietnam. And, and the mood among the, a lot of the soldiers and a lot of the grunts were, they were disgusted with the war. They didn't want to have anything to do with it. They didn't want to be part of it. And they shared that with me. And they told me, they said, kid, your old man's a lifer. Don't listen to him. This is the real deal. You know, that happened then. It can happen again. And uh, you well, consider yourself anti-America or anti-American flag? No, I, I'm, I'm an internationalist. I'm standing with the people of the world. I don't characterize myself as an American. This is where I was born. This is where I happen to live. But I'm thinking about humanity, the 7 billion, the 7 billion, you know, across the planet. And the, 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 the times are long overdue for people to stop looking at the world. Which was, the world is so, so enormously integrated and interconnected, more than any time in human history you know, pre preceding this. And it's so important for people to look at things. Global warming, that's a, that's a problem for humanity. That climate change is a problem for humanity. The, the fact that, that any, anybody in this room right now could pull the tag on their, their shirt and it probably says something like Bangladesh or, or Haiti or El Salvador. This is how interconnected the world is. So stop looking at things from the standpoint of, and, 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 and the American chauvinism, where we're supposed to be blind to, to what humanity's enduring and going through, there's two and a half billion people in the world that don't even have toilets or, or sanitation. And we're supposed to be blind to that because we have this, these comforts in this country. That's, that's repulsive to me, you know? Thank you, sir. Yeah. All right, well, if there are no further questions, we thank everyone for coming today. And uh, we hope that you will ask questions of the city. You've got the still images. You have the video. So go ask them, why has no one been held accountable for this? And I want to recognize Andrea Whitaker. Andrea, please come join us. Andrea dedicated her time. She volunteered uh, and fought and scraped to get the criminal charges, which should have never been filed. Uh, she got them dismissed against uh, Joey Johnson. So thank you, Andrea, for the work that you did. Who's the source of the video that you showed us? They, uh, I, Brian, I think they're sort of all over the internet footage. Yeah, I think some of, them, some of them may have been uh, from news footage. I think some of them are actually police officers who were out on the scene, assigned basically as videographers for the yeah. day. Um, and then more footage later on in that video you'll see is you know, from inside the jail. Yeah. The police what department. we did under, one second, Harry, what we did under fair use was basically just take clips from a, a number of different sources to show you the angles that the contention that somehow Mr. Johnson was on fire or had Sutter was on fire was simply false. And you know, one other point, if he was on fire, you would think that there would be burns on him unless he's some sort of superhero that I'm not aware of, you know, impervious to fire and heat. But he, he had no burns on him, he had no injuries on him, his clothes weren't singed at all, nor was anybody else. It was a lie, it was a dirty lie, and no one's been held accountable for it from the line officers that were there promulgating the lies and extinguishing free speech all the way on up to the brass that repeated the lies. No one's been held accountable. And uh, that's tragic because what it says about our city, what it says about the city of Cleveland is that the rule of constitutional law does not prevail. I mean, yes, it prevailed ultimately through the municipal court, but those charged with enforcing the law are lawless. And we've seen this time and again. Am I saying that about every police officer? Of course I'm not saying that about every police officer. We don't characterize it that way. The people involved here, the line officers up, were involved in, as you see from the police Twitter feed, involved in planning to extinguish speech, which they were very proud of, and clueless, or willfully clueless at least, about 30-year-old US Supreme Court precedent and the Constitution. And they did it anyway, because they Apparently they knew they could get away with it in the city of Cleveland. That kind of lawlessness, that kind of degradation of the rule of law should scare all of us. Whether you agree with Joey Johnson or not, whether you agree with his message or not. You know, I, I happen to not share many of his beliefs, but I would still fight as a lawyer and a citizen for his right to express them. Because to me, that's what the flag stands for. That's what the country stands for. 
We can have that difference. But we all need to be vigilant because no one's been held accountable. So I ask you in the media, now start holding people accountable. Don't let this be a one-day story of just, hey, it came and went, it was a settlement. No, no. The real story starts now. Why has no one been held accountable? The city of Cleveland abolished its policy a few years ago, around the time of the shooting death of Tamir Rice in 2014. It abolished the policy of they're not going to do any internal discipline as long as there's a pending civil suit. So they don't have that excuse because they don't have that nonsensical policy anymore under Justice Department pressure. So since July of 2016, no one has been held accountable for lying, and that's what it was. So every single time one of those police officers that lied gets on the stand and testifies in a criminal case, you would think, go ask County Prosecutor O'Malley, go, go across the street, go ask him today. Don't you think that you should have what's called a Brady file on all of those officers? And every time they are supposed to testify in a case, evidence that they once lied before, which is right here before you, must be given to the defense. Have they been doing that? If they haven't, they've been violating the constitutional rights and the right to Brady material of every single defendant those officers have been involved in the prosecution. Sir, let me bring it back to this for a second. Could you please pull up the one where uh, the police officer is supposedly spraying the flag with yeah. water and yeah. then the, uh, the clip where there is the Twitter feed from the police department? Yeah, we'll start. We'll, let's start with the tweets. We'll do it in reverse order. And these are on our, our website also. They're on the blog. Are we going to use these? Yes. They're just screenshots of the Twitter feed of the Cleveland Police Division. <coughs> Public records. And now we're going to pause it. You see here, the officer is involved in extinguishing free speech. There's no other way to put it. No one's on fire. And we'll keep going here a little bit. See. See? No one's on fire. No one's getting burned. There's no danger. And then what they do is they make up charges afterward. Oh, failure to disperse. Failure to comply with a lawful order. It's nonsense. If police officers act, are acting lawlessly to begin with, I mean, that happens to be an element of resisting arrest. It has to be resisting lawful arrest. So if the arrest is interference with people's fundamental constitutional rights, you can't be resisting arrest by definition because that's an element of resisting arrest. So, so this is really important. Please, media, don't let it go. Get answers. Go all the way to the top. Don't let police spokesman, or excuse me, uh, you know, mayoral spokesman Dan Williams flim flam you and say a bunch of nonsense like, go get answers from the chief. Go get answers from the safety director. Go get answers from the mayor. Go get answers from the Civilian Police Review Board, which has supposedly been reconstituted following the consent decree and is supposedly doing great things now to you know, hold police officers accountable. Nonsense. It's nonsense. It's all papering things over. Go ask the new head of internal affairs, Ron Bakeman, my former colleague from the U.S. Attorney's Office. Why has he not investigated this? Go ask them. Thank get you. answers. Thank you.